Hathaway. I direct the Asia program here, here at the Wilson Center. Um, this event today is um, jointly co-sponsored uh, with our colleagues in the Kissinger Institute on China and United States, uh, directed by Robert Daly down here on my left, your right. Um, we're here today to talk about a very difficult and serious but a very important um, issue, uh, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. Um, because we want to give, I want to give uh, as much time as possible to our speakers and our commentators and then get you in the conversation. Um, I'm really not going to say anything uh, beyond what I've already said. Um, I would encourage you to look on the back of the flyer that you picked up on your way in uh, to learn about the speakers. I'm not going to introduce them in any length at all. Um, and presumably you all picked up a copy of uh, this report, Threading the Needle. Uh, but if you didn't, it's on in the outside, and I certainly encourage you to uh, grab a copy on your way out. Uh, we're going to hear, first of all, from the co-authors of the report. Uh, we'll hear first uh, from Pin Fun Koch, um, one of the co-authors uh, who is the director of the China, East Asia, and United States program at the East-West Institute. Uh, following uh, Pin's remarks, we'll then hear from the her co-author, David Firestein, um, who is vice president for strategic Trust Building and Track 2 Diplomacy at uh, the East-West Institute. Um, I should also add that uh, Penn is currently a visiting scholar um, at the Brookings Institute. Uh, sorry? Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I got two of my, uh, two of my inter introductions uh, mixed up. Uh, Penn, in fact, um, has had a number of uh, capacities um, and uh, responsibilities and affiliations. Uh, she started out as a journalist in Singapore. Uh, Pin, I'm sorry <laughs> for that. Um, following, uh, and, and David, I should say, is a former U.S. diplomat with extensive uh, service in East Asia. Uh, following the remarks by um, Pin and David, we'll then hear from Richard Bush who is Director for East Asian Policy Studies at Brookings Institute with, as you all know, a long history of uh, working on U.S. relations with Taiwan, um, and Joe Chi, um, who is the visiting scholar at Brookings um, and uh, is affiliated with the well-known Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Um, again, uh, their bios are in the back of this flyer, um, so please avail yourselves um, to that information. Uh, and Penn, we'll turn things over to you. I again apologize for the misintroduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Um, it would be a great honor for me personally to be a visiting scholar at Brookings. <laughs> so we'll talk offline with Joe T. <laughs> um, Thank you um, for the very nice words and kind introduction. And indeed, we are very grateful to the um, Wilson Center and to the Kissinger Institute, to, to Robert. Um, for the opportunity um, to be able to present the findings of our report to all of you today. And for those of you who had attended our um, launch event, EWI's launch event for this report here in DC a couple of months ago, thank you again for taking the time to listen to us again. Um, it's also a great honor for me personally, and I, I believe for David as well, to be at this table with um, two distinguished panelists, um, Dr. Joe and also Dr. Bush, who I believe is on his way. Um, both of you know a great deal about this topic and uh, about Taiwan in general and about um, U.S.-China relations, and um, I look forward to learning a lot from your insights and to a very good discussion and debate with everyone today. Um, for those of you who aren't quite familiar with the East-West Institute, we are a um, smallish organization that focuses on um, track two diplomacy aimed at preventing conflict and promoting global security. A key part of our mission is to address the most critical issues affecting strategic trust between major powers, including US, China, and Russia. Um, and Russia, in fact, falls under David's bailiwick as well. 
And if we're talking about U.S.-China relations, one of the most intractable issues facing this relationship over the past 30 or so years has been the issue of Taiwan. Um, specifically, the continued arms sales by the U.S. to Taiwan has um, manifested itself themselves in certain disruptions in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship, especially on the military-to-military -military front, where um, the mill mill relationship has been suspended on and off every time the, the U.S. administration announces a, you know, a new batch of arms sales. Um, from the point of view of China, um, these arms sales represent an abrogation of China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, they disrupt cross-strait relations, especially right now. Um, the Chinese argument is that you know cross-strait relations are at the best in years, so why rock the boat with further arms sales? And finally, um, from China's point of view, arms sales um, to Taiwan embolden and encourage pro-independence forces on Taiwan. Now, um, many of you know, um, more than 30 years ago, on August 17, 1982, the U.S. and China signed a joint communique, the third of three communiques that they signed. Um, and this is the only communique that specifically addresses the issue of Taiwan arms sales. Now, the U.S. government in that communique, communique had committed to gradually reducing um, its arms sales to Taiwan over time, um, moving toward an unspecified final resolution of uh, the Taiwan question. From the U.S. government's point of view, this commitment was predicated on China's continued policy of peace toward Taiwan. Um, this communique aside, um, the U.S. is also obligated by its own law, specifically the Taiwan Relations Act, which was en enacted in 1979, to provide defensive articles and services to Taiwan based on an assessment of the latter's defensive need. Um, in addition, um, the U.S. had provided in 1982 um, six, a set of six assurances to Taiwan, including an assurance that Washington would not negotiate arms sales decisions directly with Beijing. Now, from Taiwan's point of view, if you talk to folks in Taipei, um, they would say that you know U.S. arms sales from, from the U.S. Um, achieve two main objectives. One is to help provide Taiwan with a credible defense, especially in light of the military modernization that's happening across the street on the mainland. And two, it gives the people of Taiwan a greater confidence to negotiate with the mainland, especially on political matters. Um, just now I mentioned um, that the U.S. actions on arms sales to Taiwan are conditioned on China's peaceful approach toward Taiwan. Um, the key benchmark for this has been um, China's military force posture towards Taiwan. Um, China has consistently refused to renounce um, force, uh, the use of force against Taiwan, <coughs> um, stating that it is retaining that option, the use of force, um, only to deter and target pro-independence elements on Taiwan. Um, over the past few decades, we have all seen that the military balance of power um, across the Taiwan Strait has um, tilted steadily in the mainland's favor. And um, we've seen many aspects of China's military modernization these days um, that would pose serious problems for Taiwan um, on a military front in the, in the event of an armed conflict, conflict across the street. Um, this situation affects the U.S. assessment of Taiwan's defensive need, <coughs> defense needs and thus the U.S. decisions on arms sales to Taiwan. Um, there are many different areas one could say, you know, the air the air, cap air force capabilities, um, the growing amphib amphibious capabilities. Um, but one area of concern and the area that we kind of hone in on in this report is really the, the um, you know, the, the growing deployments of ballistic missiles um, that the mainland is building up across the Taiwan Street. And in fact, um, Taiwan's leaders and senior officials have called on the mainland to fully withdraw the close to 2,000 missiles as a precondition for political negotiations with the mainland. Now, this report, um, Threading the Needle, seeks to address these various dynamics affecting the Taiwan arms sales issue. Um, we try to um, come from it, come, come approach this um, issue from a more balanced perspective, um, try to incorporate the viewpoints of the different stakeholders. Um, our primary objectives for this report are really firstly to explore new ways to manage um, the differences between the stakeholders over this issue, try to reframe um, the policy debate and discussions over this issue, 
um, hopefully break some old cycles and increase the level of strategic trust between the US, China, and indeed Taiwan. The contents of this report were informed by two years of track two consultations that, that EWI had engaged with um, policymakers, scholars, and military experts from Washington, Beijing, and Taipei. Um, these consultations included the several high-level U.S.-China dialogues that EWI um, convenes on an annual basis, both in China and the U.S. Um, I'll leave it to David to explain some of the key recommendations later on. But first, um, I just wanted to make some key points regarding the methodology and the conceptual contributions of the report. Firstly, when we're talking about arms sales, this report looks specifically at arms deliveries to Taiwan, as opposed to announced um, sales uh, when we're trying to judge the scale of U.S. sales to Taiwan. Um, the key reason is that not all announced sales actually result in del deliveries for various reasons. Um, secondly, we take the dollar values of arms deliveries since 1979, which is when um, the U.S. and China normalized their relations. Um, we take those dollar values, adjust them for inflation um, in order to facilitate apples to apples comparisons, especially over a long period of time. We're talking about three decades here. Um, thirdly, we believe that the arms sales, uh, the Taiwan arms sales issue is fundamentally, fundamentally a political issue that needs to be managed with primarily a political toolkit. If you look at it, say, from the military's perspective, uh, while arms sales have helped to upgrade Taiwan's defense forces and have a certain military deterrent value to some degree, um, the fact of the matter is the U.S. cannot arm Taiwan out of the problem of a military threat from the mainland. Um, it can't do it within the constraints of U.S. law and policy, and certainly within the constraints of um, Taiwan's financial ability to procure such arms. Um, the political symbolism of such sales, we think, is as important, if not um, more so, than their utility in pure military terms. Um, th Fourthly, we think that any meaningful way forward on this issue can only come about with the buy-in of the three stakeholders involved, the US, China, and Taiwan. Um, because of that, we believe that there is a way to thread the needle, so to speak, that's the title, uh, this Taiwan arms sales issue that achieves three things at the same time. Firstly, it would conform to US law and policy. Secondly, it would respect China's legitimate concerns and interests. And thirdly, it would maintain or enhance Taiwan's net security situation. Anything that would um, that will achieve the buy-in or secure the buy-in of all three stakeholders needs to achieve these three objectives at the same time. Um, the this concept this concept is um, kind of different and unique uh, because I think the concept conventional wisdom has been at least for the USG. Um, it's possible to achieve only two of these objectives at the same time, but we think that there is a, with some careful calibration, a fine balance can be achieved, um, primarily by relying on the existing policy architecture comprising the TRA or Taiwan Relations Act, the six assurances to Taiwan, <coughs> and the 1982 Joint Communique, all of which we support retaining, and we don't think that this architecture is going anywhere for various reasons. Um, fifth, we look at the two bookends, so to speak. We look not only at U.S. actions, um, but also at China's actions, because we believe that both have an effect on how this issue plays out. Um, our report concludes that um, both the U.S. and China, in the different ways and for their own reasons, have not fully complied with their commitments or respective commitments under the 1982 Joint Communique. For example, on the U.S. side, in about half of the last 30 or so years since the communique is signed, um, the U.S. has delivered arms to Taiwan in excess of the baseline value at the time that the, the, the communique document was signed, even when we adjust the figures for inflation. Um, the communique also talks about the quality of arms. Um, the commitment is to reduce both the quality and the quality of the arms sold. But on, when we're talking about quality or the types of arms, um, we don't make an assessment of whether you know, the U.S. has adhered to its commitments on the qualitative side, simply because it's more difficult to do so against the backdrop of technological advancements over the period of th three decades. 
Um, now, of course, we understand that the U.S., like I mentioned before, has conditioned its commitment under the communique on Chinese actions to um, to uh, dis demonstrate its continued peaceful approach towards Taiwan. In this regard, um, we think that certain Chinese actions or ch actions by the mainland have violated the spirit of this commitment to a peaceful approach. One example is something that I mentioned briefly just now, which is the dramatic buildup of short and medium range missiles aimed at Taiwan. Um, at the end of the day, finally, we do recognize that the <coughs> Taiwan arms sales issue is part of a broader, much more complicated issue, the question of Taiwan. And in fact, we do conclude in this report that the Taiwan arms sales issue is not the core problem, but a symptom of certain much deeper issues. One of these issues is the fact that the U.S. and China have different paramount goals when it comes to the issue of Taiwan. For the U.S., the primary um, goal really is to ensure Taiwan's security and to maintain its existing political and social systems. Whereas for China, the overriding cons uh, goal really is to achieve reunification on the mainland's terms. Um, second, another issue, and really more fundamentally, is that the, China, the mainland China and Taiwan have very stark and incompatible um, differences in their, both their political and social systems. And any ultimate solution on the Taiwan issue really needs to address and resolve this issue. David. Thanks, Pen. Uh, David. <coughs> well, thank you very much. And again, let me just briefly say it's uh, really an honor to be here at the Wilson Center. Bob, thank you. Robert, thank you so much. And again, it's a privilege to be here with Dr. Bush and Dr. Joe. Um, and thank all of you for your time. Let me pick up where Penn uh, has left off by talking a little bit more about four questions that I'll sort of pose and then try to answer uh, before uh, making a few brief concluding remarks and then turning the floor back over to Bob as our moderator. So the questions that I'd like to take up uh, are, first of all, why did we take up this topic? Why are we dealing with the question of Taiwan arms sales? Uh, the second question is, uh, what are our key recommendations? And I won't read through all of them uh, just for purposes of time, but let me at least in that section of my comments uh, touch on our key, f our key recommendations and lay those out. Uh, the third question I'll ask is, what's new or different or particularly innovative about the recommendations that we put forward uh, on this important issue? <coughs> Uh, obviously, a lot of people have dealt with the issue of Taiwan and specifically the issue of U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. So what makes our uh, conclusions and recommendations stand out? And then finally, why now? Why at this particular time do we take this issue up? So those are the four qu questions that I'll address uh, in my comments. So first of all, again, why take on the issue of Taiwan arms sales? Um, as Penn noted, obviously it's a very important issue in the, con in the uh, context of U.S.-China relations. Uh, we would refer to it as one of the principal trust drainers in the relationship, if you can put it that way. Uh, it's been a, a big issue that has proven largely intractable over a period of over three decades. Um, and certainly from the Chinese vantage, if not from the U.S. point of view, uh, it has been a major impediment to the building of strategic trust. Some might refer to it as a kind of glass ceiling, if you will, in the relationship between the United States and China. Certainly from a Chinese perspective, that's true. So all of those things are true. But it also begs another question. What is it about the current status quo associated with this particular issue that is problematic? We make the point in the report that we believe there can be a better status quo around this issue. And while that may sound like a pretty uh, pedestrian observation to make, there are a lot of people who don't accept that. But we do come from a, a starting point of the idea that there can be a better status quo, which implies the question, what's wrong with the current status quo? And we would argue that from the perspective of Taiwan and from the perspective of the mainland and from the perspective of the United States, there are very serious problems with the status quo, and to put it very succinctly, the current policies are failing from the standpoint of all three of the stakeholders, and, and those perspectives are very different. So let me just briefly run through that. From a Taiwan perspective, I think the issue is probably most straightforward. <coughs> the simple fact is, as Pin has noted, and as I think almost everyone understands, 
the uh, Taiwan's relative security position, that is relative to the mainland, has deteriorated steadily over the last three decades. I don't think there's any analyst that would look at Taiwan, whether in Taiwan, whether in the mainland or whether here in the United States, that would say that Taiwan is more secure today than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 or 30 years ago. The fact is it's far less secure today vis-a-vis -vis the mainland than it's ever been in relative terms. Uh, largely because the mainland's own capabilities have increased in a very dramatic, uh, at a very dramatic speed. So the fact is, from Taiwan's standpoint, it is um, on the losing side of a deteriorating security position. From the Chinese perspective, and again looking at it now through the lens of the Chinese mainland, uh, their ultimate goal, as Penn noted, is the reunification of the mainland in Taiwan. That's very, very clear and very consistent. Uh, many in, would argue, including myself and Penn, that in fact China is probably further from that goal today than it ever has been. Now that is a statement that many people would disagree with, and I think some would agree with. But our assessment is that if you look at uh, reunification as a long-term proposition that ultimately has to have the buy-in of the people of Taiwan, the fact is China is at a minimum no closer to that goal today, I would argue, and Penn is co-author, uh, than it was X number of years ago, and by many statistics that one could cite, <coughs> it is probably further from that goal. So the fact is, if you're looking at the issue of Taiwan from a Chinese perspective and looking at reunification, current policies, including Chinese policies, are obviously not getting the job done. And so that's why the status quo is unfavorable to the Chinese. And then from a U.S. perspective, uh, I would argue, and, and Penn as well, that the, the status quo is not ideal, it's suboptimal, because the fact is the increasing disparity between the power of Taiwan on the one hand and mainland China on the other is actually destabilizing. And the fact that it's destabilizing raises the, the, a scenario in which the United States could conceivably, <coughs> in some sets of circumstances, have to intervene or consider the painful uh, prospect of intervening in a conflict across the strait. So everyone, I think, whether from a U.S. perspective, Chinese or Taiwan perspective, hopes to see stability in this region. But the fact is the growing disparity, and it has been very steady and it continues as we sit here, in, uh, in power and the growing shift in the balance of power in favor of the mainland and to the disadvantage of Taiwan, uh, it, that is a destabilizing trend that uh, is not in the United States' interest. So the fact is uh, the current policies aren't working for any of the three players in terms of achieving their own stated objectives, not someone else's, but their own. And that's why we think that it's time to uh, deal with the issue of Taiwan arms sales, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. So that's uh, a brief response uh, in res with respect to the question of why take on this issue. And I would summarize it with one basic sentence. If you think the status quo is working well, let's continue what we're doing. <laughs> if you don't think it's working very well, then we need to do something differently because as it's often been observed, a good working definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again but expecting a different result. Now this leads to the second question, which is given our assessment that the status quo can be better and again implicit in that, that the status quo is flawed uh, or suboptimal at present, it raises the question, what have we proposed to address uh, the current situation? And so let me briefly make a few comments about uh, what our main recommendations are. I won't go through and read all of the recommendations, uh, they're obviously in the report uh, toward the end and also in the executive summary. I think some of you have read those recommendations, perhaps others have not, I hope you'll have a chance to. But here let me just take a few minutes and very, very briefly summarize what our main recommendations are. Um, so we make a number of recommendations to the United States and, and, a, and a number of recommendations to China. To the United States we recommend the following, number one, maintain the current legislative and policy architecture that governs this issue. So to be very clear, and we're, we are very clear in the report, we are for the Taiwan Relations Act. We're also for the six assurances to Taiwan. We support those. And we are for the 1982 communique. Those may sound like, in a sense, obvious statements, but as all of us who have studied this issue understand, and I know um, Dr. Bush has written about this as well, uh, there are an increasing number of voices who are not for those laws and policies, but we are for them. 
So maintain the current architecture. The second thing that flows very naturally from that is continue arms sales to Taiwan at a pretty robust level. We are for that. Uh, we believe that any cut or dramatic change in that policy would actually be further destabilizing and would not be in anyone's interest, by the way, including in China's interest. Uh, and again, many Chinese, I think, would disagree with that. But our assessment is that no one would gain from any kind of a uh, curtailment or even a re reduction on a significant scale of U.S. arms sales to Taiwan. So we believe that it's important to continue sales. That said, our third recommendation is that the United States calibrate its arms deliveries to Taiwan so that in any given calendar year, the value, the total U.S. dollar value of those sales does not exceed $941 million. And we get that figure by looking at the 1982 communique and by adjusting for inflation and extrapolating what that commit w commitment would mean in 2012 dollars, which is when we were doing the drafting of that section. And so we use 2012 dollars, which are very similar to 2014 dollars. So in 2012 dollar terms, uh, $941 million in U.S. arms sales to Taiwan arms deliveries to Taiwan in the calendar year is what we propose. Now, how does that compare with the historical record of sales and deliveries? The fact is we've delivered, we the United States, the United States has delivered to Taiwan about $1.16 billion worth of arms on average over a 30 plus year period since the beginning of this policy in 1982. So as you can tell, it's a very modest differ differential between the historical norm and what we're proposing. And it's designed to be modest for reasons that we'll discuss. So those are the main uh, recommendations we make to the United States. We also recommend that the United States unbundle its notifications, uh, which basically means instead of reporting to Congress once that we're going to sell perhaps $5.9 billion or $6.2 billion or $6.4 billion worth of arms, let's unbundle that and, and announce smaller packages so that the news is not as sensational. Um, and then the final recommendation that we make to the United States is to, at the same time as we're uh, implementing the recommendations that, that we've proposed um, heretofore, uh, that the United States also uh, take uh, specific efforts to deepen its exchanges and ties with Taiwan to make it very, very clear that there's no signal here of any loss of or uh, reduction in political commitment to Taiwan. So as we write in the report, we call for the United States continued, quote, unwavering support for Taiwan. And that's a word we chose carefully. To the, to the Chinese, we recommend uh, basically two major um, proposals. Number one, that, ta that uh, China reduce its, uh, its um, short-range ballistic missile um, forces by about one-sixth, namely to cut one brigade out of six that are located in southeast China that are um, ostensibly or, or uh, presumably uh, targeting Taiwan. Um, that would represent approximately a one-sixth reduction in uh, the number of missiles basically that are pointed at Taiwan uh, to move those missiles out of range of Taiwan, but to go further and actually dismantle some of the underlying infrastructure that supports those missiles. So when missiles are on wheels, you can easily roll them forward and you can easily roll them back. <coughs> what's, <coughs> what's more permanent somewhat more permanent about the recommendation that we make is it's not just a question of rolling missiles out of range of Taiwan, which we do recommend as, in a sense, a kind of political symbolism, but also that you dismantle the underlying architecture, and that's uh, the underlying infrastructure, tunnels, roads, uh, depots, and so forth that support that, and that would make it somewhat more permanent. Again, a modest uh, proposal when you look at the overall uh, sort of power that China can apply to Taiwan or to a Taiwan scenario, but nevertheless something that's, that's real and significant. Secondly, we recommend to China uh, that China increase its transparency over these, these issues and publish its numbers, pu publish its posture in much the same way that the United States does in our defense documents. Uh, China has generally been far less transparent uh, with, re with respect to signaling its intentions and its postures, and we call on China to be more transparent. In the remaining few minutes that I've got, um, let me just make a few other points about uh, the third question, which is what is new or, if you will, innovative about these recommendations. Um, 
Penn made a few comments about the methodology, which I think are worth making, namely that we're looking at deliveries rather than announced sales, that we're adjusting for inflation, and that we've run numbers in a way that I don't think anyone else has run them before that we're aware of. Um, that being said, we're not the first to deal with this issue, certainly. So what is it about our ideas that we think are innovative? Let me make a few points. Number one, we tried to focus in on realistic recommendations, uh, kind of real-world recommendations, not pie-in-the-sky ideas that whatever their merits are never going to happen. So some things that we did not recommend, for example, there are some who call for the abolition or rescinding of the TRA. We're not for that, but even if we were for it, that's not a realistic recommendation. That's not going to happen, probably in the lifetime of anyone in this room. So we eschewed that kind of an unrealistic recommendation, and, and in that particular case, we're not for that. Or there are people that say, call for the United States to immediately cease all arms sales to China. That's not going to happen. We're not for it, but even if we were for it, that's not going to happen either. By the same token, there are people that make unrealistic demands or recommendations, I should say, of China. Some call for China to remove all missiles from southeast China, from Fujian province, those that are pr presumably targeting, uh, that are or are presumably targeting Taiwan, before there can be any further discussions about anything. But the fact is China's not going to do that, so that's not realistic. And there are those who call for China to renounce the use of force in dealing with Taiwan. Whatever the merits of that idea at a conceptual level, China will never do it. It will never do it because to do so would be, in a sense, to renounce a sovereign, what it regards as a sovereign right. China regards itself as having, in some juridical sense, sovereignty over Taiwan, if not a de facto sense. And because it, it regards itself as having juridical sovereignty over Taiwan, it will never uh, allow itself to be hemmed into a position where it can't use force over territory that it regards as its own. So we don't make those recommendations, uh, whatever their merits. Now, the attributes of the recommendations that we've made um, can be described as follows. Number one, we call for actions that are unilateral. We call for actions that are, number two, concurrent, and number three, incremental, and number four, reversible. Let me just say a quick word on each. Why unilateral? Because pursuant to U.S. policy, which we support, namely in the six assurances, as Penn noted, uh, the United States cannot negotiate this issue with China. We are barred by our own policy from negotiating with China over the issue of arms sales. Therefore, we call for unilateral actions on both the parts of the United States and China that um, are taken ir irrespective of what the other side does. That's the very definition of unilateral. Meanwhile, we call for those actions to be taken concurrently because politically that makes it easier to take the actions. At the same time, we talk about incremental because no proposal that radically modifies the balance of power or the status quo is going to be accepted by any of the three parties. Only an incremental set of suggestions or recommendations have a chance of being adopted in the real world. And so what we've talked about is a very incremental change in U.S. arms sales policy to Taiwan and a very, and a, I would say, a relatively or very incremental change in China's missile posture and force posture vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Neither of these are designed to alter the balance of power, and they don't. And we're not for altering the balance of power in one fell swoop. What we're trying to do is create confidence building uh, measures and an environment in which the nations can take additional actions because they have a sense that we're moving in the right direction. And the fourth point I made was reversibility. It's important that the United States and China take measures that, again, because they're unilateral, uh, can be reversed in the event that the other side does not follow suit with, an, with a, a gesture or an action that the one side regards as being commensurate with what it, it has done. So if the United States doesn't like what China does in response to our unilateral action, then we will go back to doing what we were doing, very simply. If China doesn't like what the United States is doing in response to China's unilateral action, then it will go back, it will roll the missiles back, it will rebuild the depots and rail, railways and so on, and it will go back to its status quo. So reversibility is, is something that makes it possible to take initiative. If they were really irreversible changes or very difficult to reverse, these would be very difficult to accept for political leaders. Uh, these attributes address a couple of the pr conceptual problems that have gotten in the way of 
movement on this issue in the past. I think many who have studied this issue know that the Chinese have raised the idea over 10 years ago, I think in 2002, when President Jiang Zemin was in Crawford, Texas with President Bush at President Bush's ranch. And there was a Crawford initiative, <coughs> which was essentially uh, you, the United States, stop all arms sales and we, China, will do something about missiles uh, in Fujian. The problem with that proposal and the reason it didn't go anywhere, in fact, didn't really even generate a reaction, as the Chinese themselves have pointed out, is because it, it failed on two counts. Uh, number one, the issue of non-negotiability. The United States can't negotiate these issues with China, so any China-proposed deal is in itself fundamentally unacceptable because the United States can't negotiate. And the second issue was proportionality. What the Chinese were uh, proposing and have at other times proposed is cessation of arms sales for some modest uh, presumed uh, modification of their policy, but there was a sense that those are entirely disproportional, even if you could deal with each other um, and, and not have the constraints of non-negotiability. Our proposals address those issues because our proposals talk about concurrent unilateralism, as I mentioned, as a construct, and therefore you get out of the non-negotiability problem. And finally, uh, proportionality is there because what we're talking are comparably scaled changes in policy on both the U.S. and Chinese side. Let me conclude with um, just a couple of final points. Um, I think we reframe this issue in a couple of important ways. Penn mentioned one of them, but I think it bears reiteration. Um, we reframe the issue of U.S. arms sales to Taiwan by saying that you can thread the needle. You actually can attain three goals at one time. You can comport with U.S. law and policy. You can take into account China's concerns and you can keep faith with the people of Taiwan and ensure the maintenance or improvement of Taiwan's net security position all at the same time. Most people don't think you can do those three things. We think you can. That's, I think, a reframing of the issue. And secondly, um, we actually put forward the idea that by selling slightly fewer or delivering slightly fewer arms to Taiwan, you can actually generate a slight improvement in Taiwan's net security position. And as we write very clearly in the report, maintaining or improving Taiwan's net security position is a core premise of our work for one simple reason. If we, if we or anyone put forward a set of proposals that result in the, deter the further deterioration of Taiwan's net security position, Taiwan won't accept it. So there's an inherent check on that idea. And I think only proposals that either maintain or improve Taiwan's net security position are going to be able to have a chance to be implemented. Um, what's also different about our report, again, talking about what's innovative about, about the things we've proposed, is that we've actually gotten testimonials from the United States and from China, including from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, uh, Zhou, Zhou Qi's colleague, Dr. Huang Ping, who's the, the director of the Institute of American Studies, and from Taiwan from a former vice foreign minister of Taiwan. And so the fact that you have high-level uh, voices coming out in support of this report, including a former U.S. Secretary of State, in fact, the Secretary of State who was Secretary of State when the 1982 communique was signed, George Shultz, a former U.S. National Security Advisor, Jim Jones, other four-star generals and others, and a former vice foreign minister, level official of the People's Republic of China, and a former vice foreign minister of Taiwan. To have folks from those perspectives endorse or do testimonials for the report, I think, is a, is a, is a testament to the feasibility of the ideas that we've put forward. Finally, why now? Because we have a, a unique political window. Um, in short, and I'll be brief here because I know I'm over my time, uh, President Obama uh, is a second-term president. Um, he has additional flexibility now. He'll never face rate re-election for president uh, or probably for any other office. Um, at the same time, in China, you have top leaders, particularly the top two, who are now in place for presumably 10 years. They're at the beginning of their tenure. They can do things today that they couldn't do eight years from now when there's a jockeying for power for the next round of leadership. And similarly, you have Ma Ying-jeou, uh, president of Taiwan, who is uh, in his second term and also has the liberating uh, situation of having uh, extraordinarily low poll numbers. There comes a point where your poll numbers get so low that they're liberating because what difference does it make anymore? If you've got 8%, what's going to happen? If you do something that people don't like, you'll end up at 5%. 
uh, you know, at some point, you don't have to worry about public opinion at those levels. So in conclusion, we think this is an important issue. We think now is the right time because of an unusual confluence in the political calendars of all three places. We believe everyone can gain from the proposals we've put forward, the United States and China and Taiwan. We think that uh, we're not calling for a change in policy. We're calling for implementation of existing policy, both in the United States and in China. And we believe that these ideas can help lead to a better status quo. With that, I once again thank the Wilson Center, thank all of you for your time and attention. I look forward very much to Dr. Bush's and Dr. Joe's remarks. And Bob, back to you, and thank you for the opportunity. Well, thanks to both Penn and David, um, both for very succinct, pointed remarks, uh, but also for a report which strikes me as um, on a difficult topic, it's unusually balanced, uh, realistic, and constructive. Um, and I commend you and your colleagues um, who are responsible for this. Um, I'll simply underscore um, a single sentence that um, you yourself emphasized, and that is that current policy is inherently uh, in sta unstable, um, potentially dangerous, and we simply don't have the luxury to stand pat uh, on this. I think that's a very useful uh, observation. Others may disagree, and indeed um, uh, Richard or, or Joe Chi may d disagree, but I think that's a good starting point uh, for us. Uh, we'll now turn to, uh, to Richard. Uh, Richard, I've uh, introduced you earlier, so delighted to have you here. Okay. Uh, is this on? Yes. Thank you very much, Bob. It's very nice to be here. It's a great pleasure to um, make a few remarks about uh, Penn's and David's excellent report. Uh, this is a really valuable resource. It pulls together a lot of very useful information. Um, when I worked on Capitol Hill a couple of lifetimes ago, um, one of the things I did was to keep, uh, keep track of the difference between uh, uh, arm sales announced and, and arms actually delivered because there were wide differences. Uh, that stuff is probably in my basement somewhere, but I'm not sure I could find it if I needed to. I don't have to anymore because it's all here. And so uh, this study will be one of those things I put on the shelf of books and reports that uh, I need to get to in a minute's notice. Um, I think uh, most of the conclusions of the report are very sound, uh, as are a lot of the recommendations. Um, each of us comes to the subject of Taiwan and Taiwan arms sales uh, in different ways. Um, and this morning I'd like to provide uh, my own analytical perspective, my own framing. Um, I, I will say by the by that I've long felt that the August 82 communique um, was not one of the shining hours of American diplomacy, um, far from it. Uh, in terms of substance and process, it wasn't that good an outcome for the United States. But I've discussed that elsewhere, so I won't dwell on it here. Um, I'd like to make five uh, basic points. Um, the first point is that any analysis of China's approach to U.S. arms sales to Taiwan has to start with Beijing's own logic on this issue. And the starting point here is Deng Xiaoping's conversation with uh, Leonard Woodcock on uh, December 15, 1978, right uh, when we were on the cusp of normalization. And it was about arms sales. Uh, this was a difficult meeting that revealed actually that the governments had pretty significant dif disagreements on this issue uh, at the point that they were going to create a new relationship. Among other things, Deng told Woodcock that Quote, continued arms sales would amount to retaining the essence of the mutual defense treaty, that such sales would block efforts to find a rational means of settling the Taiwan issue peacefully, and that force would be left as a last resort. Specifically, uh, Deng warned that if Zhang Jinghua, quote, should lean on a certain powerful support, uh, say the provision of arms, and refuses to talk to us about the problem of reunification, unquote, that was a circumstance in which China would use force uh, against Taiwan. Um, Deng uh, made the same um, set of remarks to President Carter when he visited the United States in 1979, 
And he said uh, China had patience, but its patience was not unlimited. So what we have here is a link between Taiwan's willingness to negotiate and China's non-use of force. I would argue that linkage continues until today. Uh, it pops up into speeches that senior officials have made, and it is enshrined authoritatively in the anti-secession law. Now note how this relationship sheds some new light on the key linkage in the August 82 communique. And that linkage is between China's statement of a, quote, fundamental policy to strive, to strive for a peaceful solution to the Taiwan question, and uh, the U.S. agreement to reduce arms sales. Um, for Washington, China's stated policy provided, it claimed, a context that made weapon sales to Taiwan less necessary. For Beijing, on the other hand, the U.S. reduction in arms sales, quote, leading to a final resolution, unquote, was the precondition for avoiding the use of force um, because it was connected in Beijing's mind with Taiwan's willingness to negotiate. Um, my second point has to do with the odd asymmetric character of the bargain undertaken in the August 82 communique. Simply put, Beijing made a commitment about its intentions uh, in return for a U.S. commitment to restrict Taiwan's military capabilities. The problem, of course, uh, is that intentions are eminently and quickly reversible while creating or restoring capabilities can take a long time. You know, it, it can happen, but it takes a long time. Um, moreover, Beijing's statement of its intentions has always been done in an ambiguous way, and it has always reserved the right to determine whether circumstances have changed to the point that a change in its own intentions uh, is necessary. Um, this uh, asymmetry was not uh, terribly significant at the time the communique was signed, but the, uh, that's changed. And as threading the new needle uh, clearly explains China's acquisition and use of its capabilities since the early 1990s calls into question its peaceful intent. Based on its own logic, however, China would say that its acquisition and use was made necessary by actions by Taiwan leaders that frustrated China's desire for a peaceful solution. My third point is to question the very premise of the PRC logic that created this linkage um, between U.S. arms sales, Taiwan's willingness to negotiate, and whether China needed to use force to fulfill its goals. Obviously, whether Taiwan is willing to negotiate with Beijing is a function of its confidence that those negotiations won't hurt Taiwan's fundamental interests. Um, precisely because Beijing reserves the right to use force, however, the greater Taiwan's ability to deter an attack, uh, the more confidence it will have to negotiate. And there is plenty of evidence that there's a weak correlation at best between U.S. arms sales and Taiwan's willingness to negotiate with Beijing. Just look at the last five years. Now, by the way, I think Ma ying would probably say that Taiwan today is more secure, broadly speaking, because uh, his policies have given China more reasons not to resort, resort to coercion. So militarily, Taiwan may be more vulnerable. Um, President Ma at least would say it's more secure. But there's another reason why Taiwan is reluctant to, ne to negotiate with China. It's not just whether it has arms or not, and that is Beijing's formula for resolving the fundamental dispute between it and Taiwan. That formula, one country, two systems has been around for 30 years. Its acceptability on Taiwan is about as low in the early 2010s as it was in the 1980s. There's a broad consensus on the island, both blues and greens, that one country, two systems is fundamentally flawed as far as Taiwan's concerned. It's un incompatible with Taiwan's interests. That would seem to be a very good reason for Taiwan leaders not to negotiate on the fundamental dispute as they've refused to do, even though there might be other lesser issues on which talks are useful. But th there's no reason for the United States or anyone else to buy the PRC logic on arms sales and the prospects for negotiation. The better way for Beijing to achieve its political goals concerning Taiwan would be to make a more acceptable offer. My fourth point's related, and that has to do with how the report addresses what happened in Taiwan in over the last three decades. Uh, in brief, 
democratization has transformed how the cross-strait relations are conducted. W the sort of negotiation that Deng Xiaoping thought might be possible uh, in the early 1980s is no longer possible um, because Taiwan's voters have a seat at the negotiating table. Um, my fifth and final point has to do with the political character of arms sales versus their military value. Um, of course, the U.S. transfer of advanced weapons systems to Taiwan has a political character for both Beijing and Taipei. That is particularly true of civilian leaders in both places who happen to be the folks that most of us talk to most of the time. But U.S. weaponry is not trivial in a military sense. From the U.S. perspective, its arms sales, whether, whatever their political value for Taiwan, should also contribute to Taiwan's ability to deter a mainland attack or a threat of attack. <coughs> if we were ever to decide to come to Taiwan's defense in the event of such an attack, we would need Taiwan to hold on for several weeks while we do all that was needed to mount our defense. So Taiwan needs the capability to hold on. Optimally, optimally, if it possesses that capability, then Beijing is less likely to consider an attack in the first place. And in this regard, there's growing concern that Taiwan's past defense strategy, on which its arms requests to the United States have been based, is no longer uh, appropriate for the threat environment, <coughs> thus reducing the deterrent effect of the capabilities it has or might have. Um, in my view, actually, I think the greatest danger that Taiwan faces now and going forward is not a military attack, a, a bolt from the red, but that Beijing exploits the power asymmetry that is growing between China and Taiwan, and that Beijing seeks to intimidate, intimidate Taiwan into submission on its terms. Um, that being the case, I think the best thing that China could do to achieve its political objectives would be to adjust its terms and create a real convergence uh, between itself and Taiwan on fundamental issues like one China and whether the ROC is a sovereign entity. I think until that day, and, and because of the danger of intimidation, Taiwan has to strengthen itself in a variety of ways, including military ways. So if Taiwan is prepared to strengthen itself in the context of a non-provocative policy towards China, um, I think that we should continue to help, including with arms sales. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, Joe Chi. Um, thanks to uh, <coughs> both Robbies <laughs> uh, invite me uh, here to uh, make a comment. I think the decision was uh, uh, made in the last moment, so uh, uh, my name was not in the list, uh, and maybe some people are surprised uh, why I'm here. Um, so uh, actually, uh, about uh, um, I think more one more than one years ago, uh, two years ago, uh, in um, October uh, 2011, when I was here, uh, also in Washington Center, to listen to a debate between uh, four American scholars from different universities and uh, think tanks on exactly the same topic uh, on the uh, uh, American um, arms sales to Taiwan. Um, later, uh, in the same year, in November, uh, the New York Times published an article written by a former, I mean, retired uh, Marine uh, Corps member. Uh, he called for uh, the Obama administration for the sake of uh, uh, American uh, future generations to uh, take a broad action, uh, that is to conduct a secret uh, talk with the Chinese leaders um, on a deal. Uh, that is uh, the U.S. and its military aid and uh, 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 arms sales to Taiwan by the end of uh, 2015 uh, in exchange for China's exempting uh, 1.1, uh, 15 uh, trillion dollars that the U.S. owns to China. <laughs> so uh, you may think it's a joke, but uh, some people in China uh, took it seriously. Uh, I was invited <laughs> uh, to write an article uh, by the Global Times uh, to make a comment on it. Um, uh, I would say uh, I, 
uh, guess the least type of uh, uh, the voice represent uh, the first such voices uh, heard publicly since the Korean War uh, in American political environment, uh, domestic uh, uh, political environment in which the overwhelming demand uh, has been that the U.S. should be uh, committed to uh, Taiwan security. So this time we heard uh, another policy recommendation uh, from a, a somehow different approach and based on a more careful an analysis on China's and American behaviors related to the arms sales uh, to Taiwan in the past 30 years. And uh, uh, the same understanding, based on the same understanding that uh, the issue is one of the biggest uh, obstacles to the building of American uh, and uh, U.S.-China uh, 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 strategic trust. Um, I think the uh, authors comprehend the uh, Chinese positions very well, uh, since uh, they both, uh, I, I, I'm sure, because uh, uh, Robert's is a Chinese fluent and he has no difficulty to exchange with, uh, uh, you know, communicate with Chinese, uh, my Chinese scholars, uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, and uh, 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 Ping, uh, I guess you also fluent. Uh, you have uh, uh, you can speak fluent uh, Chinese. So, uh, I think uh, uh, you know uh, your uh, understanding uh, uh, are very uh, uh, you know uh, very I mean correct. Uh, 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 when you say that China believes that. Uh, uh, Continued arms sales to Taiwan is a viola violence of Chinese sovereignty and territory integration. Uh, and uh, also two uh, conclusions made by uh, the two authors uh, impressed me deeply uh, related to the American arms sales uh, policy. Uh, first one is uh, uh, obviously the U.S. arms, uh, uh, arms delivers to Taiwan since uh, uh, 1982. Uh, have often exceeded the level uh, of uh, supply of those uh, uh, supplied between 1970 uh, 79 to 1982. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, the U.S. arms sale to Taiwan initially is driven by uh, political consideration, uh, that is uh, to demonstrate the U.S. Uh, uh, commitment to fellow democracy, which shares its uh, uh, values, and also send a signal to its uh, uh, allies in uh, Asian Pacific uh, region that the U.S. will stand by them. Um, I would say that uh, it is true that due to the fact that the Taiwan uh, Relations Act uh, has uh, enormous political support uh, in Congress, the U.S. executive branch is unable to change it by itself. This has been uh, understood by many Chinese uh, including some uh, uh, Chinese uh, senior officials. I heard from uh, um, a Chinese uh, high-ranking official who uh, served in the U.S. in uh, the Chinese embassy to Washington uh, for many years. I uh, better not to mention his name. Um, he said to us in a meeting that uh, um, his uh, uh, experience in Washington for many years tells him that uh, uh, Consider uh, uh, given the uh, domestic politics, it is uh, absolutely impossible for the U.S. Uh, uh, government to, to abandon its uh, policy of arms sales to Taiwan. Um, but I uh, in a short run. Um, but however, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, the Chinese would tolerate this policy uh, forever. Um, I have seen. Uh, I mean, you have seen the. Uh, how uh, the the uh, that the Obama administration's announcement uh, of arms sale to Taiwan in the end of nineteen I mean twenty uh, twenty nine uh, caused the whole serious re reaction from the Chinese side. Many Chinese feel that uh, what they could tolerate in the past uh, cannot now cannot uh, be tolerated anymore. And uh, some people also think that it's a time for Chinese to say no to the United States. Um, the consequent reaction to the um, American 
<coughs> exercises uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea, I would say, um, is related to uh, American arms sales to Taiwan, as well as uh, uh, President Obama's meeting with Dalai Lama uh, in the same year. With the economic growth and uh, uh, military building uh, development, the Chinese rea reac reaction would be even uh, much more intense in the future. I think that's the problem. Uh, I, I discussed this issue with uh, uh, a friend of mine uh, uh, teaching in um, American school yesterday. We both are concerned about this. And the negative impact of the uh, of the arms sale to Taiwan on Sino-American relations would be more and more apparent, causing ups and downs uh, in our relations. Another problem to the Chinese uh, is uh, if we say Taiwan Relations Act uh, is a uh, law uh, which is difficult to repeal, uh, the six assurances to Taiwan uh, formulated by the Reagan administration is not the case. Uh, as the author pointed out, uh, they are clearly lacking the binding force of law. So I will ask, uh, if so, uh, why shouldn't the U.S. government make efforts to uh, give, the, give them up gradually? I, I, I don't ask uh, uh, for uh, immediately and uh, totally at once. Uh, if the government, the U.S. Uh, government, uh, is uh, uh, intentionally uh, to do so, uh, I mean, does so. Mm. Uh, the author also indicated that uh, the U.S. and China um, have equally failed to uh, abide by the uh, communique of uh, uh, 1982, and China adopts some uh, coerced methods. Uh, but I think they also find that uh, uh, the Chinese government's uh, of coercive uh, actions uh, were usually reactive. Uh, for instance, when the uh, uh, Chen Shui Bian obviously uh, uh, marked on the uh, road uh, in the direction of uh, uh, independence uh, in, the end, uh, in uh, 2004, the Chinese government had no choice but uh, pass the, uh, I mean, passing uh, the uh, anti secession law uh, in 2005. Uh, and it's alleged that uh, even uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush uh, himself, I mean, President Bush himself, uh, finally realized that uh, Chen Shui Bian was a troublemaker. Uh, and uh, he, uh, uh, you know, he, he uh, pursued a policy uh, not, for, uh, not, uh, not for the sake sorry, uh, of the Taiwan people, but for expanding his own power. Um, besides, I also like to say that uh, the U.S. government is not always morally superior. Uh, if considered uh, uh, the fact that uh, before uh, 1996, uh, I mean until 1996, there uh, had no been a uh, general election in Taiwan, uh, and uh, uh, Taiwan was uh, uh, generally uh, viewed as authoritarian regime, but the U.S. US uh, um, uh, supported it uh, since the, the end of the Second World uh, uh, constantly. And uh, uh, here, uh, can I mean, <laughs> many people will ask uh, why, uh, why, why you Chinese don't let Taiwan go. Uh, you may, uh, you know, if uh, you know, I heard from an uh, uh, American uh, professor that uh, uh, you know, uh, if uh, 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 the s one of the states uh, of the United States uh, like you know make makes a decision. Uh, uh, it will separate from the uh, United States by referendum. We will let it go, but I really doubt uh, whether it's true because the American Constitution doesn't give uh, individual states such a right, and uh, uh, otherwise there would have not been a civil war in American history. So uh, uh, the, well, I think the authors are correct that uh, uh, China uh, thinks it is, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, formative. Uh, I, I got it. Uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, legitimate uh, interest. Uh, here I'm not going to say that uh, uh, the Chinese government, uh, uh, domestic, uh, uh, the government's domestic and the foreign policy is always correct or uh, optimal. Uh, 
I I I know the Chinese government uh, have take uh, uh, mistakes domestically and internationally, but uh, uh, I would uh, emphasize that if you ask uh, what the Chinese people what kind of a political systems they like to have, uh, or ask them to make a choice between uh, American one and the Chinese one, I'm sure that uh, most of the Chinese people will tell that uh, they uh, prefer uh, uh, Chinese political system. So if uh, I mean if so uh, if the government, uh, U.S. government respects respects for China's uh, Chinese people's selection, it uh, uh, would it uh, intervene in the Chinese sovereignty uh, or uh, as uh, uh, also as put it uh, legitimate interest only because they are not in favor of the Chinese political system. So here uh, I I don't expect that uh, uh, foreigners can uh, think. The, the the issue uh, think of the issue uh, from a Chinese perspective, uh, but in any case, I agree that uh, I share the opinions with my colleagues uh, in China. Uh, you know, as uh, showed in the front pages of this uh, report, that uh, uh, this report touches a, a very sensitive and a crucial issue, and for the first time has, I believe, uh, has put for put forth. Uh, somehow a uh, pragmatic and realistic suggestion uh, uh, which might be uh, to some extent uh, uh, acceptable to the Chinese government because uh, uh, since the Chinese I mean since the Chinese uh, has made a suggestion on uh, different occasions that China could freeze and reduce its missile deployment uh, aimed at Taiwan uh, if the US agree to reduce and eventually end its arms sales to Taiwan um, I think uh, uh, even if that uh, suggestions uh, come true, uh, it's only a, a small step. But uh, um, uh, I, I, I think after the war, it's a move. It's a move forward. Uh, that is uh, more important. That's it. Well, thanks to both our commentators, um, Penn and David. You may or may not wish to respond to anything that's been said, but. Let's take a couple questions from the floor, um, and then perhaps you can bundle them all together. Uh, if you would raise your hands, um, and because time is brief, I would encourage you to be very brief in your responses, comments, questions. Uh, identify yourself, uh, and uh, please. We're going to go right here and then right here, or vice versa. Uh, Thank you, Dong Huiyu with China Review News Agency. And my question is for two authors. And I read the report. Uh, it, it says that uh, you two uh, went to the three uh, cities, Beijing, Washington, and Taipei, to talk to the significant person over there. I'm wondering if you have contact with the policy makers uh, in the three sides. What's their, uh, what are their reactions to your suggestion? Is what's your impression of their reaction? So is it possible? Because you know, uh, last year, uh, the PLA uh, 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 delegation proposed a uh, make a proposal to the Pentagon that uh, uh, U.S. and China should establish the working group to talk about that. But you said. Uh, we know the, the United States uh, won't negotiate this uh, issue with China. But if the policy accept your suggestion, maybe it could be feasible. So what's the reaction from the policy level, uh, maker level? Thank you. Thank you. And over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I'm Helen Raphael, a retired economist. I worked for five years on the mainland. And uh, my question reveals my utter ignorance about this question. Because are you saying that we have been selling about the same amount of armaments every year for the past 30 years to Taiwan? If so, since they haven't been in a war, what happens to these armaments? What is this huge amount that they have accumulated over all this time? Why do we have to keep increasing the amount that they are simply stockpiling? David Penn? You want to go first? I think we'll tag team. Um, and um, thank you to you both for these very good questions. Um, I'll take the first one and I'll leave David with the um, uh, to, to answer the second one. Has, 
well, all from the military point of view, I'll let you do it. <laughs> um, okay, thank you for your question about the um, about our uh, outreach to all three um, places. Um, to the extent that we can reveal without outing our sources and keeping our discussions um, confidential, but we did we did meet with policymakers um, in all three places. Um, in fact, that was a major focus um, because ultimately, what we're trying to push through are some suggested um, you know new approaches to policies, and you know who better to talk to than policymakers in all three places. Um, with regard to the reactions to the suggestions, um, as expected, they were mixed. Um, Beijing, I think, reacted more positively because, well, um, for various reasons. Firstly, we did um, we did conclude that there had been non-adherence. Um, we did conclude that there was non-adherence by both the U.S. and China to um, uh, to the 1982 communique at, at certain points. Um, so I, I think, from Beijing's point of view, they were happy that finally someone was saying what they've been. Um, saying for many years, which is the U.S. had not ad adhered to the communique um, for f at certain points in time, um, although we did say that, you know, both sides had had not had, had not been fully compliant. Um, I, I think they were pleased that uh, that we were trying to, um, uh, you know, put forth something that was feasible um, and including um, noting the um, both the U.S. arms sales as well as the missile deployments, which is um, along the lines of what um, President Jiang, for example, had been proposing. Um, although we do not, like David said, the, the issue of negotiati negotiability and the proportionality, um, which speaks again, which are the issues at heart again um, to, to what you mentioned about the um, proposal to Defense Minister Chang Wan Chen um, last year uh, about the working group those same issues come into play. For Taipei um, and DC, there was more caution. Uh, there were more cautious reactions. Um, of course, from the point of view of, 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 of Taipei, um, the first questions were, you know, why focus on the 1982 Joint Communique? For, and from their point of view, um, their priorities were, of course, the TRA and the six assurances, and there, was, there were concerns that, that um, uh, emphasizing the joint communique might somehow um, take attention away to their priorities, which were the other two parts of the policy architecture. And of course, there were concerns, there were concerns and questions about why highlight, you know, certain things. Um, but David and I, in our talks with with officials and scholars, including um, scholars from the KMT and um, DPP affiliated think tanks. Um, which we answered the questions. We, we, we showed that we were, um, you know, coming at the issue in good faith and that we're trying to be objective and, and, and taking into account the perspectives of all three stakeholders. Um, for DC, uh, also, um, the key point that was, that, that was reiterated to us, not only by policymakers in Washington, but, but also by scholars and other retired military officials were that, um, was that, you you have to look not only at the U.S. side of things, but also uh, China's actions, because what the U.S. does is con uh, predicated on, you know, affected by what the, what, what the mainland does. And that essentially is, um, you know, the crux of this whole issue of, of whether the U.S. has adhered to the joint communique. Um, from the USG, USG point of view, as we had mentioned before, um, it's... Um, commitment to whatever it actions it takes on the arms sales issue really is conditioned upon what China does to demonstrate its peace peaceful intent. So that was the key point that was conveyed to us. I think um, the fact that the reactions were mixed and, you know, nobody came up and said, and, 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 you know, all three sides didn't come out and say resoundingly in unison that this is great or resoundingly in unison that this is horrible. Um, <laughs> I think that bodes well for our efforts. It shows that, that we are trying to do the right thing. And in fact, you know, people from all three places, they tell us that we're trying to do the right thing. <coughs> and, you know, um, hopefully some traction will come out of these discussions. Yeah. If I could just add one brief word of, of comment, and I, I, I embrace everything Penn has said. 
uh, and then I'll go to the second question as well. Um, to summarize the reactions, uh, and I think Penn, Penn has accurately characterized them, but I think the reaction in Taiwan is we may not quite agree with everything, but we know this is coming from a place of goodwill. I think the Chinese reaction is we may not agree with everything, uh, but it's the most fair, balanced, and objective report on this subject we've ever seen. And the U.S. reaction is, uh, why are you stirring up the pot? But if you're going to stir it up, this isn't a bad way to stir it up. So to, to summarize it, maybe just a little bit sort of tongue-in-cheek, I think that's the broad summary. And I think Penn's exactly right in her characterization. But let me just say, we've been very encouraged uh, by the reaction that we've had in all three capitals. And consulting uh, in all three places, uh, Washington, Beijing, and tai Taipei, is a, is a a core element of the work that we did. We wanted to be very fair, very balanced, very objective to seek input, including as appropriate bipartisan input in places where that is appropriate, namely Taiwan and the United States. With respect to Helen's question, um, so just to clarify, uh, yes, since 1982, and I, I go back to 82 because the United States and, and China uh, uh, came to agreement over the um, 1982 communique in that year, uh, the United States has sold arms to Taiwan. Um, on average, it's been just over $1 billion worth of arms or um, military-related services, basically d defense articles and services pursuant to the Taiwan Relations Act every year. And uh, some years, it, the number has been higher. Some years, it's been lower. In some years, uh, in, a, in inflation adjusted terms, the United States has sold to Taiwan in excess of $3 billion worth of defense articles and services in terms of deliveries to Taiwan in a calendar year. And um, that th those types of figures, or spikes, if you will, make it clear that the United States in those instances, and Penn was right when she said that in about half the year since 1982, uh, and it's a matter of public record, the United States has sold arms and delivered arms to Taiwan in excess of our stated commitment in 1982. That's a matter of empirical record. And what happens to them is they basically are integrated into the armed forces of Taiwan uh, and woven into the, the defense uh, forces uh, and their defense strategy. Uh, we don't try to sell everything in the grand scale of arms sales. It's not a huge amount of arms that we sold, but it is not inconsequential. And it's woven into the fabric of the defense posture of Taiwan, principally vis-a-vis -vis the mainland, but also more generally. Uh, well, thankfully, there hasn't been a hot conflict uh, between uh, the United States, uh, between uh, Taiwan and the mainland, um, and these arms have not had to be used. But again, most arms uh, that are made in most countries are, 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 in a sense, made to be not used. They're made in essentially, essentially for largely deterrent effect. Yeah. And well, I just wanted to add a lot of the, the arms um, sold to um, Taiwan are really for the purposes of updating and upgrading <coughs> the existing defense systems because they're old, outdated. You want to upgrade and maintain, you know, transform a, the Taiwan's defense forces, maintain them at 21st century levels rather than keep them at 20th century levels. You just made my point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can get two questions uh, more on the table. Uh, we've got one here and then one here. We don't have much time, so let's try to keep That's things fine. real this brief. Will be, this will be short. Uh, the comment that the glass, the glass ceiling in U.S.-China relations is the, is the Taiwan issue. I think maybe 15 years ago that may have been a glass ceiling, but given the, uh, the shift in power, Chinese capabilities, the South China Sea, the Senkaku Islands, uh, I think Chinese belligerence in, in the South China Sea and the Senkakus make this not just the glass ceiling. And if the Taiwan issue went away, we'd still have an issue with China. Yeah. And right behind. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Alex Lai from United Daily News with Taiwan. Um, I have a question for Richard. Uh, what is your take on the you know, annual cap of the you know, arms sale to Taiwan proposed in the report? Thank you. First of all, any response to the first one? Just a yeah. quick one, if I may. Just a very quick response. I think it's a very good point. Um, there are obviously fundamental issues and, and disagreements in the relationship between the United States and China, even as there are also common interests uh, on some issues. So I think your point is well taken. Uh, I think the reason we use this phrase, glass ceiling, uh, is that it's a construct that the Chinese themselves have put out there, which is that 
however many common interests, however many disagreements, the fact is, from the Chinese perspective, uh, and I think this is a heartfelt sentiment, unless and until the issue of U.S. arms sales to Taiwan is resolved, there's a certain point beyond which U.S.-China relations can't develop, at least from a Chinese perspective. Now, there are those who would critique that construct and say that that doesn't seem to be the case. But the Chinese themselves, and I think uh, Dr. Bush's point about sort of looking at the issue from the respective perspectives of, let's say, the mainland and Taiwan and the United States, but in this case looking at it from the mainland's perspective, they see this as an impediment to a full-fledged blossoming of U.S.-China relations. And so I think we have to be cognizant that there is that mindset. But the point that you make is well taken, which is that quite apart from the issue of Taiwan, which is not a daily issue in a, in a real sense. It pops up and then recedes and then pops up again. There are a lot of other issues that on a daily basis are much more contentious. But we do take the Chinese at their word that this is an issue of fundamental importance because it goes from a Chinese perspective to the issue of sovereignty and territorial integrity. And so we wanted to address it in recognition that at least from a Chinese perspective, it's a critical issue and what they sometimes refer to as the core issue in U.S.-China relations. Um, in response to the question here, um, I, I, I guess the point of my um, presentation was that um, arms sales is the, quote, the most sensitive and important uh, issue in uh, U.S.-China relations because China says it's so. Uh, but That's that right. doesn't mean we should accept that. Um, I think that the reason China hasn't fulfilled its political objectives is not because of our arms sales, it's because of its offers. Uh, and so, um, in the spirit of the communique, I think we should um, be properly restrained in our arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, I think that this was a, a mutual commitment at restraint. Um, the danger of setting a cap is that it becomes a hard ceiling um, rather than a floating average. Um, what else was I going to say? I, I do think that it's become very important that we look not at the value of the arms sales in dollar terms, but what's their value uh, militarily. Do they, how much do, does what we sell to Taiwan contribute to deterrence? and contribute to creating an environment in which, uh, on the political level, the two sides can continue to try to find a way to work out their differences. Thanks. Let's put one last question on the table, then we'll allow each of our uh, participants to have the final word. Here in the middle, yes. Thank you for your comments. I'm a recent graduate of Syracuse University on international relations. I have a more interesting uh, question. Um, cyber warfare has been an intense topic in recent years, with uh, Taiwan receiving hundreds of uh, cyber attacks each day. So I was wondering, in your report, did you consider the factor of cyber warfare and consider the possibility that the U.S. will include um, advanced technology transfers in future arms sales? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, very good question. Thanks for asking that. Just. Uh, Absolutely, the issue of cybersecurity uh, or cyber warfare in this case is a very important one in the cross-strait equation and in U.S. relations with China, obviously, and also in the sort of triangular dynamic between the mainland, Taiwan, and the United States. We did not delve into it uh, in any specificity in our report, um, but your point is well taken that the cyber, uh, I, I would presume that cyber-related uh, capabilities are now very much part of the mindset and thinking and decision making uh, around the issue of U.S. arms sales. So when we talk about arms, uh, you know, it's a broader construct today than it was, say, 20 years ago or, or, or 10 years ago. Um, but that's not something that we delved into specifically uh, in the report. Uh, I would say, however, that the East-West Institute, our institute, does deal with the issue of cybersecurity. Uh, including issues related to cyber warfare, and we do work very closely both with China and with Russia and a number of other key stakeholders in the world as another part of our work, but that was not deeply uh, woven into the report itself. Pin, any last uh, comments? 
Um, yeah, just a quick um, response to Dr. Bush's last comments about the um, cap. Uh, in terms of whether, you know, when we were talking to folks, uh, especially including USG officials, about, you know, the, the proposal uh, in draft form for a cap, and we did actually receive some suggestions about, hey, why do you want a hard annual year-on-year -year cap rather than a, you know, um, floating average, similar to um, sim uh, rolling average. And David and I actually went back and, you know, Crunch seriously the numbers, yeah. crunched the numbers and explored the issue. And we figured that, you know, we were trying to see whether we could come up with an alternative um, recommendation that, that would essentially um, propose a um, rolling average along the lines of maybe every four year, uh, every a given four year period that's in line with uh, mm -hmm. maybe a presidential term. Um, but then we found that we would probably run into some methodological um, challenges. What happens when a new administration takes over? Um, that kind of thing. Um, so and the number was lower. The, the number was lower <laughs> too. <laughs> so thank you. So the, so the likelihood yes. of it being embraced by the USG yes. was even less than what our recommendation is. But we did look at that, and it was a good yes, thought. It was. A Richard, any last comments? No, I'm fine. Joe No. No. Okay. Well, then I'll have the last comment, and I would have anyway. Uh, <laughs> thanks to, I tried to, except with my wife. Uh, <laughs> thanks to all four of our panelists. Um, this is really a very thoughtful uh, report. If you haven't gotten a copy, they're available right outside the door. Um, I expect we will return to this topic uh, again and again, um, but our thanks to all four of our panelists for really contributing to this important discussion. Now, if you will join me in expressing our appreciation to our four speakers. And thanks to you as well, we are adjourned.